Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi. This is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. In Matthew's Gospel, the notion of a guest is a useful metaphor. A guest owns nothing, controls nothing, provides nothing, and can do nothing when the host asks them to leave. If you hate being at the mercy of another, the best way to deal with their invitation is is to throw it in the trash. Unfortunately for those who shun God's invite in Matthew, the Lord is not from Minnesota, and as such, his aggression against them is definitely not passive. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 1 to 7. You're listening to the Bible as literature. This is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 354 of the Bible as Literature podcast. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, He is coming back at them to address the same issues, speaking to them in parables. We're coming off of Matthew 21, which honed in on the destruction of the edifice built by the hand of man, the edifice shored up by the hand of man, the edifice defended by the hand of man, the edifice that we create to protect our own against whatever it is that's outside the walls. At the end of Matthew 21, we were told that the cornerstone, which sits in the middle of the Roman arch and holds everything together, was a teaching. So if you're building with a teaching, there is no wall, there is no infrastructure. God is your shepherd in the wilderness. No highways, no walls. God performs his action by teaching. God's word is what he breathes. This is the foundation of this city because in the last parable, like you said, Father, the scribes and the Pharisees won't accept the foundation of this city that keeps this city standing, that keeps this city safe, that is the city that the human being finds refuge in. It belongs to God, but it is undergirded by God's word, by his teaching. If you don't accept the premise that keeps the wall standing, then the wall can't protect you. When you enter this city for protection, you have to understand the architecture and the assumptions that hold this thing together. The one who doesn't accept that, the wall is going to fall down on him and grind him to powder, as we said before. God is inviting those who want to come into the city, but if you don't think that the city can protect you, you're going to build your own city. The kingdom of heaven is the theme that runs throughout Matthew, and ever since Jesus entered into Jerusalem, the point that he's been making is Jerusalem belongs neither to the Roman nor to the Jew. It belongs to God, and he just lets people live in it, just like the rest of the land. For God, the city is not different than the rest of the land because God can protect his people in the middle of the wilderness, in the Midbar, or he can keep his people safe inside of his city. Like a city, no city, he keeps them safe as he keeps them safe because the foundation is this teaching. It's not an actual wall made of stone, and people are fighting over the walls made of stone, like you said a moment ago, Father. People want to build their wall with their hands, but then it's not God's because it's not undergirded by his teaching that forms the foundation of the wall that human beings can't see except with the eyes of his teaching, which is what the spiritual 
eyes means. It means you're seeing with the eyes of his teaching. The breath of God is animating you so that you see things correctly according to Scripture, with Scripture as the reference. If you build a border wall with the gospel, there will be no such thing as an illegal immigrant. And if you're going to react and say, why is Father Mark talking politics? You're just lying to yourself. You're not hearing Scripture. It's not a political question. There are no illegal people in Scripture. There are only brothers and sisters, and the land belongs to God. To say that you build a wall with the Torah is to say, in effect, there is no wall, because there is only one earth which belongs to the Lord. So please, don't assume because we're critiquing your political stance, that we're making a stance on a political basis. And we'll critique everyone's political stance, because the king to whom we submit doesn't hold office in the United States, with all due respect. That is the citizenship we proclaim, and the city to which we belong, and that is what Matthew is talking about. In Torah, you accept the stranger in your midst, because you were a stranger in Egypt. What does that mean then? Everyone functions as a stranger. So I'm fine if we talk about Mexicans being immigrants, as long as we understand ourselves as being immigrants, as we understand the Native Americans to be immigrants, because we are all sojourners in God's land. The only one who is illegal is the one that God declares illegal, and he casts them out. But we are all sojourners on God's earth. And that's the point. We are all his guests. And we're going to talk today about the party that we're invited to as his guests. And that is what the kingdom of heaven is. The kingdom of heaven is his party where he invites guests. The only person who is not a guest is the host and his son. As you hear this, you have to keep hearing the refrain of verse 1 because it's drawing a parallel with the parable of the tower and the vineyard. It's kind of a take two with how God deals with us through his son. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son, and he sent out slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were un willing to come. So if you read this in parallel with the previous parable, you have again God, who is the father figure, the king in the parable, dealing not with employees who are rejecting his son from the inside, but now that Jerusalem has been destroyed and we're dealing specifically with the kingdom of the heavens, they are rejecting it from the outside. They are invited and they don't want to come in. It's inverted. In the previous parable, they were inside and didn't want to leave and didn't want to allow anyone in. Their stubbornness persists in version two, but the folly of their stubbornness is more explicit because now we know clearly that we are speaking not about Jerusalem, but about the kingdom of the heavens. When we were talking about the people working in the field, they were in the field and they wanted to keep the field for themselves because the owner was absent. Now we have a party where the host of the party is present, but nobody wants to come. They all want to be absent. Everyone wants to avoid being too close to this landowner slash party thrower. And Jesus says, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's this party where people are called. You want to come to the party? Come to the party. And people say, yeah, I don't really want to come. Okay, that's the reality of the kingdom. You tell people, hey, you want to come to the kingdom? A lot of people are like, "Eh, no, thanks. It's like American newlyweds. The way people think of their household, they really believe that when they get married, it's their household. You invite your dad over and your mom for dinner in your, quote, house, you sit at the head of the table. This is unacceptable in traditional cultures. It's certainly unacceptable in Middle Eastern culture. When my dad came to my house, may he rest in peace, he sat in the place of honor, not me, because it's his table when he visits. 
Here in Matthew, the Lord cuts through all of the nonsense in declaring that it is a feast for his son, which means he has propriety, nobody else. It's his party. People will say, what's the big deal? Why is it about power, Father Mark? Because it is about power. You're making a showing in the flesh when you say to your parents, this is my house. The land and everything in it belongs to God in Scripture. Even if it's, quote, your household, it belongs to him. And you were behaving in Jerusalem as though it was yours. And now because you can't take possession of it, you want no part of it. You don't want to go to a party where you're not the center of the event. That's the human problem. Can you go to the party, take your seat, and not be the host and the proprietor? It's clear that the chief priests and the Pharisees have difficulty with this. Again, he sent out other slaves saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fattened livestock are all butchered and everything is ready, come to the wedding feast. This parallels the grace of the previous mashal. He's saying, give them a second chance. Tell them how generous I'm being. I want to give them every opportunity. Even though they have dishonored me, I am a generous father who is unprecedented in his mercy because no father in his right mind would put up with this mistreatment. Why did you turn down my invitation? Look how sumptuous the feast is. And of course, you only get three chances in scripture and now we're on chance number two. Not sure how the outlook is for these characters. They were invited the first time, maybe humanly speaking, they say, oh, This king is just being nice. We don't want to trouble him. Oh, maybe it's not a real thing. And then he invites them again. I think this is interesting. He went out, sent the same servants to invite them again and describes it. It is all ready to go. All you have to do is come in and eat. It's like when you drive by the restaurant and there's the neon sign, immediate seating. All you have to do is go in and eat we can't forget this is a parable of the kingdom all you have to do is come in and party like that's all you have to do and obviously it's not that far away because the servants just walked out to these people literally you just walk there sit down and you eat why someone would refuse that this is the question that this raises he is challenging the scribes and the pharisees by saying why would you refuse the simplicity of this. Ever since Jesus entered into Jerusalem, he's been challenging the whole rigmarole of the temple. When the sick were coming to him and he was healing them, what else do you need a temple for than where the sick can come and receive help? I hear people talking, the only function of government is to protect its people, and therefore the only thing we have to take taxes for is to fund the military. That's what Christians say in the United States, which is the most absurd thing, when number one, Scripture says the only thing the king must do is take care of the widow and the orphan and the stranger, and the one thing that the king may not do is collect horses and chariots. (laughs) So the only thing that the temple is for is to heal the sick and to teach the teaching. I don't want to forget that. And they're one and the same. And the only point in the king is to take care of the weakest of his people. And here is a king who has a dinner and he's ready to invite everybody. Come and eat. Anyone can come. Please come and eat. It is ready to eat now. There's an intensity to this parable that is expressed in, in the speed at which we arrive at judgment. It's almost a recap showing you once again that they are stubborn and the only possible outcome for them is destruction, those wretched, wretched ones. But they paid no attention and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. So we are back at the original problem, the original issue in the first parable, that they are so hell-bent on exercising their own control over the things that belong to God that they are willing 
to commit murder. This time, they're not murdering the son, they're murdering the slaves, which is an interesting twist, frankly. In a way, it alludes to the plight of the martyrs in the Roman Empire. First the son was murdered, now the slaves of the father, and now they are the ones being murdered. It's a very interesting literary move when you consider the broader context, the narrative arc of the New Testament. But we're heading quickly towards strike three, and we're only in the beginning of this lengthy parable in chapter 22. It's impossible to hear this mistreatment and murder of these servants without thinking of the parable of the vineyard that we just heard a moment ago. And it's ramping up the intensity of the insult. First you say, no, thank you. Then you say, shove off. And then you kick the guy in the groin and then you kill him. The intensity grows, as you said, Father. And as the intensity grows, it's gone from slighting the king to insulting the king's honor by killing the king's servants. I mean, you're now destroying the king's property, just like in the last parable where they refused to give the fruit to the point where they just wanted to take the entire vineyard. Now they don't just want to blow the king off. They want to send a message to the king that we do not care one whit for your wedding and for your son, and the insult now is direct and unequivocal that we hate your invitation. The hatred and insult towards the king is what's happening. Let's take it in the context. This is a parable against the scribes and the Pharisees. As they refuse the invitation of the kingdom and stick with this complex rigmarole that makes them feel more holy, they are doomed to ramp up their insults as they double down more and more. Because, okay, you want to say, I don't care for the city of the king because I don't believe it's actually going to hold up. Then you start to build your own city. And then you start to arm your city. And eventually, you're just going to go to war with that city. The human being here is going to ramp it up, just like we've seen twice now. We've seen them ramp it up when it came to the vineyard, and now we're seeing a ramp it up when it comes to the wedding feast. The human being is not satisfied with simply slighting the king. They want to insult and put their thumb in his eye so he knows how much they hate him. People like to say that the Old Testament is violent and they prefer the New Testament. You know, it's tiring because you keep hearing this over and over again. The New Testament God versus the Old Testament God. The Bible is so violent. Let's hold a seminar on what to do about violence in the Bible. Meanwhile, you're pulverizing Yemen into the Dark Ages, but you're having a crisis over Deuteronomy. Well, I have news for you. There is destruction in Deuteronomy, and it should make you feel uncomfortable because it puts you under pressure for what's happening in Yemen. And Matthew here is dealing in the currency of Deuteronomy, when you are brought into the land, we've mentioned this example before, and it's highly relevant here in between chapter 21 and chapter 22. You're brought into the land and you're being shown destruction. Now, Christians hear the first part of this parable in chapter 22, and they get excited with their anti Semitism as though they're replacing the Jews. This is ridiculous. Matthew is doing a do-over, just like in Deuteronomy, the people were shown the destruction of the Canaanites. Now the Canaanites are being shown the destruction of the Israelites. And it goes on and on and on as we progress through. We'll see that pattern. But here in Matthew, the king was enraged, and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. It's a do-over of 21. It's a fulfillment of the cycle of three and the coming judgment within the confines of the parable. And for every Gentile hearing this text, who is tempted to feel triumphal as though now 
Christianity replaces Judaism, you are reading the story incorrectly. You should feel queasy that this is how the king dealt with people who didn't come to the party. And now he's bringing you in? I mean, think about it in basic terms. It's like a megalomaniac mafia boss kills off his wedding party and says, I would like you to be my friend. Are you going to be comfortable and at ease at that party? No, because you construct your own loving God out of your theological worldview. It's very difficult for you to see the mob boss of Deuteronomy as the mob boss here in the parable in Matthew. But that function of God as a kind of Don Corleone in the story is the defense and the bulwark that the poor living in Bethany have against your cruelty. And should they cease to be poor and come into the land and become insiders at the wedding feast, it's also a hedge against their potential cruelty because no one is righteous. It's not poor versus rich in Scripture. It's God versus everyone. Because someone who is poor on the outside suddenly becomes someone who has wealth on the inside and they become the problem. It's this hot seat that we're talking about. You never arrive because you can always be thrown out. And once you arrive, you become the problem. It's the perpetual state of discomfort, instability, and revolution that is posited by the biblical narrative to keep us from carpet bombing Yemen. I don't know how else to say it, Richard. And the creative way that this parable functions is that no reader, when they read this part, think, wow, I'm one of those people who refused that invitation. I'm one of those people who killed that servant. No, they're automatically going to think of themselves as not those people. And they're going to say, yeah, those guys got it. I know I'm not going to get it because I'm in. I accepted the invitation. I decided to come. It sets up this line that puts the scribes in the Pharisees on a side where there's a false sense of security because they say, oh, well, things seem okay to me. Now, this is written after the destruction of Jerusalem, so there is a destruction of the city where the chief priests have their base of operations. It is dangerous when you read this after that point. But within the story, somebody who reads it says, well, I came to church. I heard this parable being read. Obviously, I accepted the invitation, so I'm good. That's the comfortable position that the rest of the parable is going to undermine. The idea in Matthew is that entitlement and propriety, the presumption of your propriety over something because of who you are, is completely undermined because God can raise up children of Abraham from stones. So what do the chief priests and the Pharisees control in Jerusalem? What do they own? What belongs to them? Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.